podcast number 436. Copy and paste when bad designs happen to good buildings. So uh, over the last couple of podcasts, I've talked about uh, maintenance issues and I've talked about um, just basic spear catching um, in buildings and how to recover from them, things like that. So I'm going to use some of the elements from that. I don't, I'm not going to have a PowerPoint to show you. Um, I'm simply going to talk, um, but I'm going to give you some examples. And then I'm going to give you an example of a really tragic case that turned out to be pretty good in the end because somebody actually learned from what they did. Um, we've all run across installations where it's very obvious that the that the construction drawings were boilerplate. And by boilerplate, I mean um, they didn't really read the scope. They, they thought, well, I've done this before. I'll just copy what I did before and put it on the drawings, and we're all good. Um, they didn't walk the job site. They didn't um, understand what the scope of work was about. They didn't really pay that much attention. They just simply said, well, I've seen this before. I'm just going to copy and paste and do it again. And now before I go too far down that road, I, I think it's very important that we keep a library. I keep a, I keep a library of all the different systems that I've programmed, for example. Um, I have a Siemens library. I have a, a Schneider Electric Andover Controls library. I have a Distech Controls library. I have libraries for just about everything I've done. But that doesn't mean that the thing that I've done will fit everything. One size doesn't fit all, in other words. So um, if you keep a library of things that you've done, whether it's drawings or software writing or, or just, just about anything, that's good. That saves you a lot of time. But it's not a time saver when you take that and copy it and paste it into another drawing without thinking about what are the consequences of it, without, without understanding the scope of work that's involved, uh, without knowing what your timeline is, knowing what the equipment is all about. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some examples here. Um, and I'm gonna ask a question first. My first question is this, is it cheaper to spend the money up front taking your time to design it properly than it is to have somebody go back on callbacks over and over and have to redesign it and then buy new material based on your new design. Which is cheaper, to spend the money up front or to spend the money going back and redoing the job? That's the burning question. And, and the, the answer is really obvious. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. It's cheaper to do it up front. So the burning question is, why aren't we doing that? And here's, here's a, a few examples. Recently, I had the opportunity to work with a group in the greater Colorado area that wanted to put in all new fan powered boxes and get rid of the water source heat pumps. So the sales engineer, I can't believe I'm, I'm gonna tell you this. this, this really happened. The sales engineer went to Google earth pulled up the building zoomed in on the building and counted the units that are on the roof of the building what he didn't know was the photograph of that building was five years old a lot of changes had been made in those five years so he based his design on what he counted on the roof of what they're going to take out and what they're going to put back in um, taking out water source heat pumps putting in a different type of control, a different type of uh, system, um, taking out the, the hydronics and putting in electrical is, is basically the center of what that's about. So he built his whole design based entirely on what he saw on Google Earth. He didn't ask what is needed. He didn't go to the job site and walk it. He didn't find out what the customer's intention really was. He didn't read the scope of work. He said, well, I, I've done this so many times. I can just look at Google Earth, count the boxes, and order new different boxes and put it in. So that's what he did. Not only did he not order enough units, he didn't realize that he had to 
put in reheat coils as well. So all the units were the units that showed up were swapped out, but they didn't have reheat coils in them. So they didn't plan on electrical work being done either. So they had to go back, reorder the right equipment, order heating coils. Oh, and they wanted electrostatic filtering and not regular filtering. They had to reorder the electric static filtering. They wanted UV lighting in the mixing chamber. He didn't know that. So they had to order UV lighting. So all of this had to be reordered and then go back and put in. That ended up costing a great deal of money simply because he assumed he's seen it before. I've built this before. I'm going to copy what I built before and just put it on this set of plans. And that's what he did. He didn't pay attention to sequence of operation. He didn't pay attention to equipment type, equipment needs. He didn't pay attention to the customer's needs. So the field technicians had to go out there two or three times just to redo that job. I'll give you another example out of Houston. There is a refinery. There's several refineries in Houston, but th there's this one refinery that they were, uh, they gutted this building, reinforced the building, made it explosion proof, and then put in um, explosion proof air handling equipment. One of the things that was clearly mentioned in the scope of work was 15 different types of gas detection systems. Well, the person, the engineer that designed the installation didn't read that part of the scope. And he also said, well, I've done this before. I'm gonna copy this other refinery and because it's, it's similar to what I, the equipment that's in this other refinery is really similar to what they wanna put in here. We'll just change the brand name. That's what we'll do. So that's what he did. He put that into the design. The uh, programming, now, the way this particular BIS company works is they have a separate group of people called programming engineers. They write the programming for the field tech. The field tech doesn't do any programming except maybe to modify programming every now and then. The programming engineers looked at the sequence of operation, but they also looked at the drawings and looked at all the other stuff and said, well, this is what they're doing. We'll write our software accordingly. They didn't include what to do with the 15 gas detectors, 15 different types of gases were being detected in this unit. So they didn't, they didn't bother to look at, at that because, well, it wasn't on the drawings and they didn't ask any questions. So they wrote the software around for this air handler unit around the idea that there were no gas detection systems in it outside of CO2. So when the senior, senior tech, got out to the job site, they put everything in, they got it up, they were getting ready to commission it. That's when they found out um, from the commissioning agent, there are no gas detectors in this stainless steel explosion, explosion proof air handler. And it was really expensive air handler. So I don't know if you've ever worked with explosion proof equipment before, but when you put gas detectors in, you had to make a hole. Well, that violates the integrity of the explosion proof container. So after you make the hole and put the gas detector in, you now have to make that explosion proof. And then you have to wire in the gas detectors. And then you have to rewrite the software to match what's going on in the air handler. If this gas is detected, do this. If that gas is detected, do that. There were 15 different gases being detected and not one of them were addressed in the, in the programming. And not one of it was addressed on the installation. So I went out there and I had to work with an explosion proof expert. I forgot the name of the company, but um, I worked with a guy that that's what he does. He makes things explosion proof. So we drilled the holes, put in the gas detectors, wired them in. We had to swap out the controller because it took an entirely different controller. Now that we had 15 more inputs to put in, um, and we had to put in, we didn't have an explosion proof box in the wall. So we had to take that down and put an explosion proof box in the wall. We had to put the controller in, set up the controller, commission the controller, wire in the new controller, and then write new software right there. And this, this all took over, I think this took a week and a half, maybe two weeks to get this done. The cost of redoing this was more than the, initial cost of the job just to redo this one air handler 
was more than the cost of, re, of, of the initial job. So we had major slippage. I believe that's the buzzword that's used nowadays. We had major slippage on this. So what did they not do? They made a lot of assumptions. They didn't read the scope of work. They didn't walk the job site. This, this is two now. Um, they didn't ask any questions. They didn't ask questions internally of each other. They didn't, the programming team didn't ask the design team, why does the scope talk about gas detectors, but there's no gas detectors on it? They didn't ask. They simply wrote software and assumed it was, that it was taken care of because after all, the guy that did the design work surely must have done the walkthrough and surely must have read the scope. So they didn't include programming either. So all that had to be done at a, at a tremendous cost. I'll give you another example, and then I'll get to the good one. There's a building in Katy, Texas. It's 15 stories tall. The chillers are in the basement of this building. The cooling tower was on the roof. The design engineer didn't do a walkthrough, didn't read the scope. He, he thought to himself, because and I know this from personally, because I asked him, you know, do, did you use your head for more than a hat rack? It's basically what I asked him. I, I was more polite than that. But the bottom line is, did you use your head for more than a hat rack when you did this design? What he did was, well, I've, I've seen this before and I've done this before. I'll copy and paste on from an old old job that I did last year where the where the cooling tower was on the roof and I'll just paste it here. What he didn't take into consideration was the chillers from the basement, the cooling towers on the roof, and the way he designed it, the controls for the cooling tower were two floors below that. And he put 24 volt actuators on the roof. Um, the piping was eight inch piping and 10 inch piping. I don't know if you've ever tried to close a valve on rapidly moving chilled water through a cooling tower with 24 volt actuators. I got called in because actuators kept burning up and, and the company that installed it wanted to know why are the actuators burning up? Dave, go look at it. So I went out there and looked at it and that's what I discovered. 24 volt actuators. The control system that sent the 24 volts was two floors below the cooling tower and the pumps in the basement weren't strong enough to adequately meet water pressure requirements for getting the cooling water to the roof. So we spent several weeks redoing that. We moved the control system to a rain tight environment. We put 120 volt actuators in. We put relay banks to manage the, um, the current influx of the actuators instead of going direct, because the way he hit his redesign was even, let's just go straight off the controller with 120 volts and that's a mistake. So we, we got that fixed. We ended up having to have the, the entire cooling system recommissioned. We did a point to point checkout and then we had to do a recommissioning of the coolings of the chiller, of the chiller plant and the cooling towers on the roof. We had to have all of that recommissioned. We had to have it electrically inspected. You know, we, we went through all of this. So the expense of doing that was far greater than what it cost them to install it in the first place. So, so what I'm getting at is these, these guys all did the same things. They made assumptions. They cut and paste from older jobs without realizing the consequences of doing that. They didn't walk the job. They didn't talk to the customer. They didn't read the scope, not thoroughly if they did at all. So they spent a fortune redoing it. And, and I, I can even think of one more example. Uh, recently, a very large hospital somewhere in Colorado, a very large hospital, was reconfiguring their chiller plant. To save time, they didn't want the lead technician to write the software for the chiller plant because he was busy uh, and he really was he's he was slammed he had more to, more work to do than he could say grace over so they hired this guy out of washington state to write the software for the chiller plant 
the guy didn't read the scope. He had never written uh, for a chiller plant before, but he knew the language that this software needed to be in. And that's why he was hired because he said he could do it. He had never done a chiller plant before. And they paid him a good deal of money to write the software. When the software was installed, the chiller plant crashed. It just, everything shut down completely. So the, the lead technician went back out there and manually got everything working, got everything up and spent the entire weekend, a holiday weekend, by the way, rewriting all of that software, reinstalling it, doing a point to point checkout and recommissioning the chiller plant. They still paid the guy in Washington to write the software, but the cost of redoing all of that was greater than the cost of the initial installation. And that's a shame, but this is common. Now, these are extreme examples. There are lesser examples than that. Um, maybe somebody forgot a uh, humidity sensor. They, maybe somebody forgot to put in a temp sensor. Maybe somebody forgot it needs a reheat coil too. And I've seen that. I've seen where coils have been left out of designs because the guy didn't read the entire scope. You know, so it goes from one end to the other. And I'm giving you some really extreme examples, mostly because I've been involved in solving the problems that, that these other people created. So I'm going to give you a final example and I'm going to show you how this company turned a miserable failure into a shining success story. Somewhere in Houston, there is a school district that is fairly sizable. This company, the, the school district decided to completely renovate the HVAC system. The company that got the contract didn't really pay attention to the scope. They used a lot of boilerplate. They used a lot of cut and paste. They did a lot of, and they'll admit this. They'll tell you to your face. If you ever want to know who they are, write me. I'll let you know who they are, but I'm not going to mention their name. They did a lot of guessing. They did a lot of guesswork. They didn't, they did not walk the job site. They did not talk to the customer. They assumed a great deal. And then they got um, a set of drawings where it was very similar to what was going into this school district. They had done another school district and it looked really similar. So they just did a lot of cut and paste, pick it up and drop it in. <clears throat> they didn't take in consideration if the fan power boxes needed reheat. They didn't take in consideration whether it was a hydronic system or an electrical reheat system. They didn't take anything into consideration, quite frankly, and they lost their shirts because they had to go in and completely redo the installation from top to bottom. And it cost them a few million dollars to do it over. They were getting ready to go bankrupt and shut their doors when another company bought them because this other company dealt in the brand of controller that the first company dealt in. So this other company bought them and immediately instead of firing everyone, this company said, what lessons have we learned from this? And these are the lessons they learned. And these are the lessons everybody needs to learn and implement if they want to be successful. The first question you have to ask yourself, is it cheaper to do it right the first time than it is to redo it one, two, maybe three times? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. If you're not willing to say, let's get it right the first time, you need to ask yourself why you're not willing to do it right the first time. Are you not able to do it? Are you just too lazy to do it? Um, you're in a hurry. You've got more work than you can say grace over, so you don't have time to do it right the first time. There's any number of reasons we give ourselves for excusing ba bad behavior. What this company did, they implemented a policy of doing it right the first time. They even have a checklist now that they follow. Did we do a walkthrough of the job site at least once? Who went with us on the walkthrough? Because they changed, they changed the rules. They didn't just Google Earth the site. They didn't just assume things were going to be this way. They didn't just send one guy out to do the walkthrough. They sent the sales engineer. They sent the project manager and they sent whoever lead tech would end up with the job. They sent all three of those people to do the initial walkthrough, to sit through the bid reading. Um, we're going to bid for this project. 
Um, so they sent three people instead of just one person to do the walkthrough. They had meetings with the owner. They had meetings with the engineers, they had meetings with the mechanical engineers, they had meetings with the electrical engineers. They had meetings with the architecture firm. For every step they took in their design process, there were a minimum of two people involved, the designer and someone to check his work. And sometimes there were as many as three people involved, the designer, someone to check his work and someone to check that person's work. They went to this extreme on purpose because they had already lost several million dollars on a failed independent school district installation. The lessons they learned were it's cheaper to do it right the first time than it is to spend a fortune on callbacks and redos and reorder equipment. So they do the walkthrough. They read the scope. They signed off that they read the scope. Then the person who checked, did you read the scope? Ask him questions from the scope. I mean, they went to this extreme. They really did do this. Did you read the scope? Did you catch this? Did you catch that? Did you catch that? The scope itself and the drawings went through at least three people. And all three people had to write down a list of things that had to be paid attention to. Then they compared notes. And then they checked to make sure that they all three caught everything. Things will slip through. But at that level of checking, they were successful from that point on at starting to do it. So when the design process went to programming, for example, this company had their own team of programmers. So that's what they did. They wrote the programs, gave it to the lead tech. The lead tech installed it. And from there, the lead tech would modify it. So whoever wrote the program would have another programmer review it. If it wasn't reviewed and signed off on, the program did not go in. They did the same thing with the graphics. Are the graphics what the customer wanted? And the graphics guy met with the customer, read the scope of work, looked at the drawings, read sequence of operations, and he signed off on everything he did. And then somebody else checked his work. My, I'm gonna mention my mentor's name. She, she is, was a, just an amazing teacher. Her name is Jayla Murphy, and she used to be known as the queen goddess of all things Andover because she was a brilliant Andover control specialist. She, she's the one that taught me use your head for more than a hat rack. She had a saying that she drilled into us all the time. Do it, check it, do it, check it. She also had a saying, expect, inspect, expect, inspect. Did you do it? Yes, no. Who checked it? Yes, no. What were your expectations? Who checked your expectations? And did you meet those expectations? And that's really it in a nutshell. In other words, before you do a job from the ground up or, or renovation or anything like that, walk the job site, have some, at least one other person with you who will catch things that you may not see. And you'll catch things that he may not see or she may not see. Now this company in Houston that renovated itself would send the project manager, the sales engineer and the lead tech out there to walk the job site. They would take time to sit in a room and read the scope with each other. They would take time to look at the drawings with each other before the design process even began. They'd get the bid package out, they'd look at the drawings and see what all is involved. Before the estimator submitted his estimate, the sales engineer, the project manager, and the lead tech would look at the estimate to make sure that everything was covered. I've done estimating myself. I know how easy it is to miss something. So, yes, it costs more upfront to do this than it does to go back and re redo it. I mean, no, it didn't cost more to redo it. It costs more to do it up front than it does to not do it up front. And that's the bottom line. It will cost money to do it right the first time. But the expense you have at redoing it is far greater than the expense of having it done right the first time. Every field tech has felt this pain. Why can't they just do this right the first time? Now I have to go out of my way take time that wasn't scheduled for this project and correct somebody's bad work. This happens a lot and it doesn't have to. Do the work, have someone check your work. Every step of the way. 
when the lead technician would install the project, whoever worked with him would look over his shoulder the whole time just to make sure it was being done right. And that's not an offense to anyone. It's not a slight to the lead tech. It's a guarantee that they both will do the right job the right time. And before a point-to-point -point checkout was made, the project manager and the design engineer would walk out there and walk through the job with the technician and make sure everything was covered. The thing that they did all along the way was called accountability. They didn't just account to the customer, they accounted to each other. They made sure each other was doing the right thing every step of the way with integrity, with honesty, with truthfulness, with good design skills, with good programming skills. Every step of the way, they double checked each other's work. Yes, it took time. Yes, it took, you had to pay for that time. But they discovered it's better to pay for that time up front before the design even begins, then it is just go back on callbacks, go back and redo this, go back and get mechanical things fixed, go back and fix your software, your graphics. It costs more to redo everything than it does to do it right the first time. That's pretty much it. That's it in a nutshell. Quit copying and pasting and start doing your job go to the job site, walk the job site, take at least two people with you so they'll catch things you miss. Be accountable to each other during the design process. Have somebody check your work and have somebody check that person's work. Yes, sometimes you need to go to extremes and, and I'll tell you how you'll know if you need to go to that extreme. How many callbacks do you have on an install? If you have more than one callback, you need to start thinking about your design process. You need to start thinking about your programming process, your graphics process. You need to start thinking about accountability to each other because in the end, you don't want to look like a fool to the customer and you don't want your reputation in town to be, oh, they're okay, but they do 75% of the work and then somebody else like me has to go out there and fix it. If you want to keep from hiring a spear catcher, do the job right the first time, use your head for more than a hat rack, do it, check it, do it, check it, do it, check it. Have other people check your work. What are your expectations? Did you meet those expectations? What did you expect from the lead tech? Did he meet those expectations? All of this is easy to do. And yes, it's expensive to do it, but it's still cheaper than redoing it. And that's pretty much it. So that being said, I want to show you at Smart Buildings Academy, we have a really good designers course. Uh, we certify the, the design cert certification course. We have BAS um, advanced design. We have BAS hardware sizing and selection boot camp. We have MSI in a box. We have building automation fundamentals, control sequence fundamentals, Niagara basics, BAS protocol boot camp, BACnet boot camp, IT for BAS professionals. IP controls, design, and implication, implementation. You'd be amazed how knowing these things will shore up your deficiencies, make you more aware of what you need to think about when you do your design work. Stop copying and pasting. Or if you do, make sure that what you're copying and pasting is modified to fit the job you're designing for, not to fit the job you have already done. So check out our design courses. We have an awesome design uh, series at Smart Buildings Academy. It's really worth your time to do it. This will help you reduce your callbacks because you have done an excellent job on your design work because we have shown you how to think about design in a way that you probably hadn't thought about before. Well, that's pretty much it. Um, I just would like to encourage you to look at this design course. I'd like to encourage you to, to make noise. If your company doesn't have the philosophy of expect, inspect, doing it and checking it, then make noise and make sure that you implement a program where you're accountable to each other and accountable to your customer and you get it right the first time. That's pretty much all I've got. 
I hope you have a good day and thank you so much for joining me.